Okay. Says it's working, so I'll give you back host. And of course, not TA and just doing a check in. Okay, thanks. No problem. Um, I can't test anymore on the custom live until right on the hour. So if there's a problem, I'll, I will holler at you quickly so that we can see. Okay. I don't expect there to be, but never know. How have you been? Good. Good. Better when the weather's good. It's a dreary oh, overcast day again, so. It's that way here all of a sudden. And we are live. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hi, Patty. Hello there. I'll wait about a minute or two till we have other people enter class. Hi, Brenda. All right, well, welcome to everybody coming in for class. If you are brand new, thank you for joining me and I'm glad you found us. If you've been here for other classes and chose to come to mine today, thank you for that too. I'm glad you came back. So I am gonna mute everybody right now, but what I tell everyone in my class is if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask me right away. I don't mind that at all, that way we can go through it in a logical way that you ask me the question you might have then. Also, I will try to keep the chat up and check on that every so often in case you put something in chat. It's also a good place to share ideas for resources if we talk about shopping and getting things that we get. So I am going to share my first screen and you should see the first slide. And it is the title of today's class, The Art of Collage and Torn Paper. Can everybody see that? Okay, good. And I put my people over to the left. That's why I look over that way. And I'm going to open up my chat box. Like I said, I like to sometimes just see if anything is going on there. All right, so we can get started. So this is a way to do it a, a different way of creating art. I found it a couple years ago. Well, actually, I knew of it. I, my background's in art, but I had never really tried it much. And then I took a little class with a local art company, and I've been doing it ever since. I love it. So I have it separated into collage and torn paper. There is a little difference in my mind. So it's kind of like that. Uh, I don't know what else they say this with, but all torn paper is collage, but not all collage is torn paper. <laughs> How's that? That's a little bit of a caveat there. This is what I look at as torn paper. And that is the one I'm going to focus on when I teach you what I'm doing that you can try. Uh, but we're going to look at the other things too. So in case you haven't been here for one of my classes before, my name is Christine Hess, and I live in South Central Pennsylvania, right below the state capital of Harrisburg. I have a BS in art education, and then I went on for my master's in training and development at Penn State. And I worked for 38 years in healthcare education. The first 24, I was on a pediatric floor working with the children and their family, doing a lot of art, art therapy, education, um, and then I went into patient education where I worked as a system resource for the whole organization. I've also had an antique business on the side 
and I'm very um, active with environmental issues and volunteered teaching with Envirothon groups. So that's another passion of mine. But I also like that I get to interact here with get set up older adults and teach art to them. So I also take classes and that's long, well, it's probably back in November, September of last year, I found to get set up for taking classes and then I became a guide um, and I've been enjoying teaching. So that's a little bit about my background. So at Get Set Up, we ideally learn from each other by seeing each other and talking to each other. And for those of you who are with me and have your cameras on, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I like to see smiles. I like to see waving hands if you have a question. Um, I often say maybe you want to jump up and down about something. That's okay, too. And uh, we are being live streamed today. So I tell the people who are watching us on live stream, the best way to participate is to join us as a member, register for class and come and do what my other learners are doing and seeing me and talking to me. So um, that's a, a benefit to being a member of Get Set Up. And remember that Get Set Up is not paid to promote any specific products. So today what we're going to cover, we're going to learn what a collage is and view some examples of collage and torn paper art for reference. And we're going to understand the process for creating torn paper art by me showing you my example. And then we'll also discuss resources and materials used for creating collages. And then we'll have a wrap up. So this is looking at what is a collage. So collage is a pretty broad term that encompasses many ways of doing it. And I picked out three main examples here. And the definition is a collage is a piece of art made by sticking various different materials such as photographs and pieces of fabric or paper onto a backing. So that's very general what a collage is. Um, the one on the left is what I always looked at as far as a traditional concept of collage where you're taking bits and pieces of maybe photographs or other pictures and reassembling them into this more abstract type of art. Uh, the one on the right is one that I don't really commonly think of, but it's included in that you can take a whole lot of little pictures or pieces and assemble them into a shape that becomes a collage. And maybe you've seen electronically where they take all these tiny little pictures and put them into a form that puts the colors into a, when you pull away from it, the colors make it look very much like a picture. If it were with real materials, that would also be like a collage. I guess you could call that an electronic collage. And the one in the middle is the one we're gonna talk about with my example, which is more torn paper. And so this you can see looks very much like a painting where they use paint to make these colors, but it's all torn paper. So that's just a little bit of a, a variation on how to do a collage. So here's the first example I pulled out for the more traditional abstract type of collage that I used to always think about. And this artist is actually my daughter who works in advertising and she's in the creative field, but um, art is more like a thing she does for fun and on the side. And she made these collages and they had an auction and a friend bought them for her daughter and son's room. So I asked Ashley what she did for getting uh, supplies to do this, the, the materials that went into it. And interestingly, she lives in New York. So a lot of New Yorkers put things out at the curb for recycling and take what you want kind of thing. And she found a box filled with textbooks and more like high-end magazines. Think of National Geographic or Life or those things that have really beautiful photographs in. And she used them to create these collages then um, and framed them. So that's that's what I used to always think of when I heard collage, this, this more traditional concept of taking parts and pieces of other things and reassembling them into a different um, creative thing, whether it would be 3D, I've seen 3D things, or more flat 2D surfaces. So this is a good example of torn paper art, which 
actually does also include cut paper. So in this artist uses scissors and cuts a lot because you can see the very, very fine pieces of grass and, and um, cattails and things like that. And even in her water, she cuts strips. So she is using scissors for this. Um, I looked and found a lot more who also tear the paper to do it. But Deborah Shapiro does beautiful, very painterly type um, compositions with her collage. So there's one that's more abstract with some torn paper. And then these are uh, more what she does with them looking like paintings. And I just think they're beautiful with what she does with them. So that's, that's the torn paper slash cut paper art example. And now we're going to talk a little bit before I show you how to, we're going to talk about the process and how I came to find it. So the one on the left is the very first one I did probably like four or five years ago. I took a little class here uh, with a local art group and a woman was teaching this and this was on a five by seven piece of fiberboard. So she had the background pre-painted and she also had like four different bird pictures we could use to trace and do the shape on that paint. And then she also had the best part was, she, besides teaching me what she knew about this, she had a huge uh, group of different decorative papers that she had accumulated because she's done this for quite a while. And she left us just rated and get what we wanted. And many of them were high-end, expensive, um, Japanese-style handmade papers. So a lot of them have these designs on them or textures. And we could use them and rip them and do our birds. So this was a Carolina Wren. And I really did use her um, bird shape she gave us. And she talked us through what we had to do. And that was what I came up with. This was then done a couple years later. Well, maybe it was the following year because I don't have this one dated. But I then decided to do more on my own. And I just kind of got really involved with it and loved doing it. And since I had only ever painted or sketched or used those kind of materials, I thought this was a new and, and fun way to, to do something. Plus, sitting at home for a whole year without going anywhere and doing things, I really was, you know, looking for more creative things to do. So what I ended up doing is using magazines um, because I didn't have all these fancy expensive papers and um, I just thought, well, I'll see what I can find in the magazines. And I started to really get into finding pieces of the picture that had uh, designs and textures in them to then use to imply what I wanted to in the bird. And I stuck with bird theme for quite a few, you'll see. But I really was looking at, um, you know, how they translated then to look, show a little more interest in that area. So here's some flowers that kind of, when you pull back, you know, have that feather feel to them and some striped designs from a magazine to give the reference of the wings that are striped. Um, it's always fun to find things for the logs and the trees because there's so many things that have that bark feeling to it. So that's what I started to do. Um, and you'll see, I did a few more. So here's a couple others. And I picked these two side by side so you could see a little difference here. The bluebird was done last year. The kestrel was done the year before that, 2019. So the bluebird, you can see as far as the bird goes, I found more pieces of paper that were solid colors. There's a few that have designs on, but for the bird itself, I don't know why, I just was finding shades that I used for some differences to give the feather feel. And the, the orange breasted portion has different shades of orange in, same with the white portion. Um, in the leaves and in the bark, you can see there are pieces of paper that have some pattern in. Also, Usually for my birds, I paint the eye and the beak and possibly the feet. Everything else I use torn paper or sometimes I do cut, like you can see these leaves here I cut out. I just was doing a different effect for them. So sometimes I use scissors and cut for a sharper, cleaner edge. Often I rip because I like that rough edge texture too, but I wanted you to know I do paint a little bit of details just because of the, the intricate kind of delicate feel to that. I don't able to, I think I've 
torn paper for a beak or cut paper out for a beak, but usually I'm painting it. So that bluebird with some solid colors is very different from my kestrel with the pattern paper. And I've come to kind of decide, I really like the, the different patterns. It gives it just a different pop and feel to it. So I've started to look for more pattern pieces that I can use in different ways to, to give that um, feeling. Like here's stripes in, in the tail that are actually on a some sort of picture I found in the paper and all these little details in the flowers and all, you know, when you pull back, some of that gives the illusion of dots or lines in the feathers or, or feather parts to it. And even in the leaves, you can see those leaves have patterns in and give you a different feel for like sparkling sunshine on the leaves. So there's just a different feel and you'll figure out what way you like to go with it, you know, what type you like to use. Um, it's really like using mosaic form of putting pieces of paper together to come up with what you're trying to replicate from the picture you're using or looking at. Questions so far? We're going to talk about the process, but I'm just trying to give you a feel for what these finished pieces look like. So all of the ones I'm showing you that I just kind of did in succession are done on five by seven canvas boards. So those are the little um, like artist boards that are not, not the kind you stretch on wood and have space behind them, but the ones that are on hard pressed board. And in the beginning, I was getting packs of like six at Michael's. And um, it was fairly economical, especially when I got them on sale. But now I found the Dollar, the, um, dollar Tree store has them. So you get two five by sevens for a dollar or one eight by 10, or you know they even have small ones. So they work fine. Any surface that would be hard and have some um, substance to it. So cardboard isn't really good if it's gonna be flimsy because when you wet that, it might warp a little bit. So think in terms more like of masonite or a thin piece of plywood. Um, you know, if you do have very hard board that you could put it on, that might work some sort of cardboard. So that's a little bit about what it's done on. Mine are all on the five by seven canvas boards. Does everybody know what I mean when I say that? Yeah, okay. Because usually you use them for like painting acrylic paints on some sort of paint scene. And I stick with five by seven right now because it works really good for, you know, keeping the bird the emphasis on it. I don't do much in the background. Perhaps if I was going to do a more complicated picture, I'd go and up to the eight by 10 and a larger one. So Christine, this is my chickadee. Yes, go ahead. Do you paint the background first? Yes. So I am going to tell you that in the process when we work through it step by step. But yes, I do. I, it's much easier because you'll see in the example I did for this class, I forgot to paint the background and I got carried away doing the drawing first. And then I painted the background and it's much harder to go around all those, you know, painted lines and fill it in. It's much better to just put that paint down and then draw on top of the paint. So yes, that is, that is something to keep in mind. And you would think after I did so many, I would have remembered, but I was kind of rushing to get it started. So so this is the chickadee I did, and this is a close-up, so you can really see those torn edges here and in my little berries. And I like that that torn paper, which ends up showing some white through because you're ripping away the ink. I like how it gives that feeling of maybe a highlight or just a little bit of different separation to the colors. Um, here in the tail, I did cut, so you can see those are some sharp lines because I cut straight tail feathers in it. Um, but in the body, I, I did almost all tearing. So that gives you a looser kind of more feathery feel to it, especially along the edges. I like how that turns out. I painted the beak, I painted the little eyeball, and I did cut these feet out of paper too. And even in the branch, since this branch, you can see on the, on the further, farther away view is very thin. So because of that being so thin, I did cut a lot of those pieces of paper to fit into my branch and like in these very thin branches. So that's just a close up to show you ripped edges, 
versus the straight cut edges um, and the effect you get from it. And here I use paper on the feet. I often do paint them, but the beak was painted and the eyeball was painted. Any questions on that? Okay, so for inspiration and references, I really like Instagram. I have an Instagram account where I just save a lot of bird photographs. I follow Audubon. I follow, uh, there's another bird one, a bird, Birds and Blooms book or something. Um, I, I just really love some of the photographs they get. So here's some examples of ones I've saved. That's a painting, but painted bunting, which is beautiful colors. And I actually got to see one of them in the wild here in Pennsylvania. It was amazing. It was at some backyard bird feeder and people were coming from all over to see it because it's an unusual sighting. A toucan would be great. Um, I've never seen one of them in the wild, but beautiful colors. This is a chickadee, much more, you know, like monochromatic, very um, basic colors. But I look at these poses and kind of pick one where I, I like the shape of it and the structure and, you know, think about the background and what it's sitting on. So this one is a Baltimore Oriole or a Northern Oriole. And that is the one I want you to keep in mind. This is the one I chose to do the sample demo on that I'm using for this class. And I loved the colors. I like this pose and the fact that there's some foliage here that I could put into the picture. I often look to do that with it too. So Instagram is a great resource if you're on there. The other one is Pinterest. So I have a really well used and um, what I would call one of my main go to resources for things with art. I have a torn paper art page where I've saved other artist creations so that I'm inspired and just see the different ways of doing it. And um, a lot of these are similar to what I'm showing going to show you as far as process goes. Now there's some like this one is more abstract and has those bits and parts and pieces put together, same as this one. So those are more of the old fashioned kind of collage, I think of. But then there's also some other ones that are really cool with animals and flowers. There's somebody who does look at that beautiful fox. That's really a lot. So sometimes I do get really carried away with making smaller and smaller snippet pieces of paper. But I the first run I did was big, size paper and then I started to get really small too small and then I went back to try to have like a medium um, place in between not too small not too large to get the effects of paper that I'm using and some of these are really large so they end up putting pieces of paper together just like I said like a mosaic or think paint by number where you're putting blobs of color down and when you pull back it turns out looking you know more like you're using painting. So that's Pinterest as a resource too. Questions for any of those resources or references? The other thing is, of course, you can look on Google because if you Google um, collage art and you do a search and you go to images, that's what I like to look at. I'm very visual. I like to see pictures. You'll get many, many examples of collage art. And that's just like going to a museum and getting to see all what these artists are creating. So that's a good place to go and look too. I get to save them when I look at them on my Pinterest though, and then I can go back and see them again. So let's talk about the supplies you need before we get into the process. So I already said the canvas board or hard backing that isn't going to be affected by the moisture and make it work. And this is a, one of those five by seven boards that I use a pencil and an eraser so that you can kind of get rid of your eraser, um, your pencil lines if you happen to see them. So usually they do get covered over with your pieces of paper. You can do that very easily. So it's not too often that you really need to worry about erasing. I don't think there's been many times I've had to do that. Acrylic paints just for those basic backgrounds and maybe the little details. And I put a picture of these acrylic um, ones that are in those squeeze containers that you can get at the craft store. They also have them now at my Dollar Tree store. So you don't have to use high-end expensive acrylic paints like you would when you're doing a painting. You can use just some of the basic craft paints, they call them. 
Scissors if you want to cut out sharp edges instead of ripping. Magazine, books, or photos, such as what I have piled up over here. Decoupage glue, and this is the brand I bought and use, and it's just one that's been around forever. I think I remember in the 70s, maybe even the 60s, when I did decoupage on, on uh, wooden boxes, I used this. It's called Mod Podge, and this is the gloss finish, but I like the matte finish that doesn't get too shiny. And brushes. So here's just examples. I use very fine one little one for putting the glue on my pieces of paper and then a broader one to coat the whole thing when you're completely done. So those are really the only two sizes you need is a is a fine one and a fat one for at the edge. Questions about supplies. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. What do you paint your background with? None of those would do that. Um, yes, the, the acrylic paints here. So are you familiar? What kind of brush? Um, a fat one. I just like this one. I just spread it on because remember you're covering that whole board. So I would just spread it on and cover. And sometimes I give a little shading to it, you know, a little lighter or darker there. I'm not real particular about making it all one exact same shade. But if you mix up a batch or you use it straight from the container because you like the color of blue they give you. I mean, the background is secondary. So even in that chickadee one, it was gray. I often use more nature-oriented ones, greens, blues, every once in a while a yellow or an orange that could be like, you know, associated with sun, grays, a tan. Those are all colors I use for the background. I've seen people do more crazy colored backgrounds, um, but I keep them lighter and less, less seeking attention than the bird. I want the bird to be the focal point of it, so. Oh, and this little picture up here is one from when I'm working on it. I wanted you to see, I, I usually work at a, a little TV table or out at the TV because I'm watching or listening to something. This container is one I got at the Dollar Tree store. It's got divided sections in it. So I end up saving some of my magazine pictures if they have really good patterns on them or they're things I think I'll reuse. Often, though, if I'm doing really small snippets that I pull from the magazine and just use a little, I do end up with like tiny pieces like that. I'll throw it out. But here you can see this was trees. This was like a parking lot or something. And I was using them for the leaves. And so if it's got really good shades in it and textures, I'll stick it in my container to save it. There's the little tiny brush when I paint my um pieces of paper with the glue. And I used the same Mod Podge glue for the, uh, the paper as I do for coating it. Two reasons. Number one, it's good consistency. If you would use, somebody said, can I use Elmer's glue for the paper? Yes, you can. But you know, that white glue is thick. So when we did this class the first time, the woman did give us a little dab of white glue to use for the paper. And I ended up, and she even said, use some water with it so it thins it out because you don't want that thick globby glue on it. So Mod Podge decoupage glue is already thinner and it works great. And then if any does stick out of the edges, it's all gonna blend in and be the same finish as what you coat it with. So it all looks the same as compared to, you know, I don't know if Elmer's glue would dry if you see too much of it too shiny compared to the mat. I just use this and I have a big container so it's gonna last me a while. Um, and I do, I do put the paint, the um, glue on the piece of paper and then I stick it down onto my board because somebody asked me about that. There is, There are ways you can, people sometimes paint the board and stick the paper onto the onto the glue there. But I always put the glue on my paper and then put the paper down. Christine? Yes, go ahead, Catherine. Hi, um, do you, uh, after you've done the whole thing, do you seal it with something? You don't? Yes, okay. yes, and I didn't get to the process yet. So okay. I'm gonna go step by step. How Thank you. you, thank You're you. You're welcome. So I just wanna give you like this upfront feel for what I'm doing when I get prepared with my materials and what it looks like. So here again, a little bit more about supplies. So this is a five by seven board completely covered with paint the way, you know, the preferable way. And then on top of that is where you're gonna put your little outline of your bird and your leaves or whatever. 
these are samples like Good Housekeeping magazines. I used these because they had some great clothing with lines in and, and shadowy effects that work great for birds and feathers. Now I wanted you to see, oh, and here's the container that holds my different colors. Um, but I wanted you to see these squares. There's three squares here and there's one back here. They came in a little small bag filled with paper scraps. And I got them at Walmart and they were only like six bucks. Um, so they did have some designs on them. A lot of them were solid, but some were shiny and some were, you know, different finishes to them were textural. And so that was a good cheap resource to find some papers that I can use from. And then the other thing someone told me about, and I do have some, are those um, scrapbooking papers that you can get in the scrapbooking aisle. They have so many different ones of them that might really work good for designs. Now, I look at them as more expensive high-end stuff, unless you get them when they're on sale for like 25 cents a piece or something. But this, this pack of paper really had a lot of scraps in it that I'll have for a long time and be able to use. So that works good. You don't want anything too thin, like tissue paper and things that might be too thin, like certain um, almost newspaper type magazines. I know AARP makes a magazine, but they also make a newsletter. And so those newsletter things, if you wet them, it loses the colors and gets saturated. You want things that have some sort of substance to them that when you wet it, it still maintains the color and all. So looking through magazines for pictures is good. I separate them into colors. And then I, like I said, I really like to look for a variety of patterns and contrast so that I'll have that to come through in my painting in my collage. So let's talk about the process. So pretend this whole background is painted. That's what it should be. And then I do a very basic outline of the bird and the foliage or, or bark onto my painted background. And this is what I get. So when I do these shapes, I don't try to get details. I don't try to get every feather or, or every line. I'm looking at mostly the areas that are very um, separated. So you have the orange of the breast and the black in the head and the wings have a little bit area here that's like in between and the tail. So you probably can't remember. Let's go back right there it is. So here's where I would separate it. So let me do this to help you maybe see. So all right. So say I am tracing this for some shape idea. Now my my uh, mouse is not going to be too cooperative here because I'm not using a pen. But what I want you to see is the basics for some of the things I would want to separate. I really use my eye for looking at the uh, colors on the bird after I have these basic shapes planned out. And then I look at the magazines and think dark orange, light orange stripes. You know, so those are how I separate my bird into areas that I then look at colors for. Same way with the leaves, you know, they're just very basic. I, I didn't even put all of these in. I choose and do some artistic um, choices with what I'm going to make that look like. This is, okay, so you understand that? Does that make sense to everybody? So here I have a thing about bird shapes. I do this in my basic drawing class too. Um, this is just a way that you could take a magazine picture and trace around it for your um, shapes that you want to do. Now, I broke this down into shapes for then sketching with, but it's very similar idea of what you would do if you were going to turn it into collage and areas and all in how you then take that. So this would be done with a piece of tracing paper on a magazine picture. In this case, I'm using my iPad. And one thing nice about an iPad, if you pull up one of those pictures from Instagram or the web, you can just um, use an app or you can put your paper, your, your see-through type paper onto the iPad and it shines through and you can then draw your basic shapes using that. So that's what I wanted you to see with that, is that coming up, up 
Yes. I'm sorry, one other question. What program are you using? Are you using- I will, a Yeah, I'll show you that in the, um, in the resources because it is a um, drawing sure. app that I really like and use for some other things too. Okay. And people want to know what it is. So, but keep in mind that could be tracing paper and a magazine. So do you know how to do the basic transfer of your sketch to the board? No, okay, I'll talk about that. I learned this like way back, I'm fourth, fifth grade, it was something we learned to do. Um, think of it like almost um, carbon paper, mimeograph paper. You can trace the bird and then on the back of your drawing, you put pencil, scribble pencil on those lines where you're going to transfer it. And then you flip it back onto your board and draw over your bird again. And everything pushing through that pencil is gonna transfer onto your board. So that's how you then transfer. It's like, on the, if you had carbon paper and you wanted to use it in between, you could, but it makes a mess. So really you're putting lead pencil on the lines that you're gonna turn over and transfer on your surface. Does that make sense? So that's, yes, yeah, so that's to get it the same direction. If you wanted to make it a mirror image opposite, you could take your drawing, flip it over and scribble on the back of it, wherever the lines are. And then it's going to push those lines through to your board. And then you'd have a reverse image. I always like to keep mine in the same direction so that I can really mentally transfer those colors to it. Everybody understand that? Okay, good. So that's background, sketch the object, simplify it. Don't worry about all those details because the details will come through in your choices of paper. So here's a little bit working through then with the leaves. I just decided to do that first. Um, I look at all these different shades of green and I rip them and I add them in there. I ripped a lot for this bark. You can see it kind of makes it look barky. <laughs> that's not a word, but that's what I call it because it's like little layers on it. So overlapping, yes, you overlap. It doesn't have to be a lot. I kind of play around with what I want to be seen for the color versus, you know, covering up. Um, as I said, I put the glue on the paper and then paper to the surface because I can kind of slide it around better that way. If you put the the glue on the board and then stick your paper on top of that, you're kind of um, stuck into that area where you know you don't, if you leave it exposed, then there's some on your board already. I just get more control by putting the glue on the paper and putting the paper down on the board. So here we go a little further and this is where I'm working on the breast, the orange parts you can see. So for the underneath where it's darker, I was looking for darker oranges. As I work my way up, I'm looking lighter. And even here, I looked for one that had some lines in it for that feeling of feathers. It's not gonna be exact, but it gives you the idea of it. So that's just a little close up. It's still ripped edges. You can see the edging here is rough. Even my leaves, I left rougher on this one. I don't cut as much as I did for some. Um, sometimes the leaves and the bark I cut more for, but um, often I've been ripping more. So here's a simple YouTube demo, and we're gonna just look at it real quick because somebody asked me they'd like to see me doing this. So it's, it is um, something you can see how they do it here. They do it a little more sloppy, you know, because they're using big pieces of paper. So they draw their picture, which is just, and I think this was meant to show to like children for a school setting. And then they pull, you know, paper. This is a nice glossy magazine filled with different colors in and they get all their papers lined up for what they wanna use. They are ripping it. So you see the white edges are ripped there and they're looking at a lot of solids. So then they're gonna do it almost like, you know, mosaics you're sticking side by side. They put the glue onto the surface and put their paper on top of it. And they're not too concerned how much sticks out because in the long run, the whole thing's gonna get coated over and you're, you know, she does it as she goes. She does underneath and on top as she goes. Which you could do a little a bit of that if you want to. And then after the whole thing dries, you could do your final coat. I usually have pretty much plain paper when I'm done on top 
versus what's underneath with the glue. She's also doing the whole background here. So for me, I'd, if I had to deal with that, I'd have the glue in my hair and everything. It would be a mess. <laughs> I'm a little bit neater than that. Not, not often in other ways in my life, but when I do this, I'm a little neater. So that's just the basic, very basic how-to. And here's the finished one when I did it. Um, I did paint the beak. I painted the eye. I painted these feet and I did these little stems with balls and some flowers on just because they were so delicate. Um, the blacks here I picked were more solid, but you can't tell really well, but it's a sheen on one of them, shininess and one isn't. Here I picked black that had stripes in it for those stripes in the wings. Again, not exactly how it is in, in nature, but it gives the impression. Though my husband thought this was a robin, so I thought, oh my gosh. Oh, so does, that's not a good thing. I'm like, no, it's an Oreo. <laughs> My Robin wouldn't have black and stripes on it. It would be brown. <laughs> anyway, it, it was pretty successful with, I did, someone else said, oh no, I could tell that's an Oreo. So that was the finished thing. And what I do then after I have all my paper down, I let it dry really you know, a good amount of time, maybe an hour or so. Then, and that includes, you know, you're painting the details. So you want them to dry good too. So I sit it aside, let it dry. And I come back and I coat the whole thing with a finished coating of the decoupage paste. And this is the part that you'll flip out for because you'll think you're ruining your picture because it's milky, cloudy white. And you take your brush, like I said, a fairly, you know, broad one, not like three inches broad. I'm talking since this is five inches here, you know, maybe like an inch or a three quarter inch brush. And I really put the bidet punch glue on and I load it up and go left to right. And I stroke, keep dipping in it and get it so that it, um, now my thing froze. Oh. That freeze. Okay. I think I'm running out of batteries on my thing. So anyway, I'm going to use my, my pad. I go from left to right and I just am doing nice broad strokes with my brush to coat it and thickly enough that you know you're you're covering the surface and then after it's all coated i kind of put it on the uh, in the glow in the shine of the light the sun or whatever or a light to see if you see any spots that you missed because that has happened to me where you think you coated it and you went over one and make sure you have it at all that it's all coated it's going to look cloudy white but then and when you like another good hour at least it dries clear and your whole bird is gonna come back and look normal like it should. So don't let it mess you up in your brain that you think you ruined it. Um, then if you wanna do a second coat, you could. I almost always do one coat, just a nice, and the, when it dries, it still lets some of that um, 3D feel of some of those edges and texture come through. So. I like one coat, some people want it thicker with two, that's up to you. But I would really let the first coat dry a couple hours before you put the second one on. You don't wanna go back and forth too much with your first coat because you might lift up edges. Also, you don't wanna do the second coat too soon because if you hit a wet spot, that's gonna like pull and really ruin your first coat. So make sure drying is, is done. Make sure the drying happens. And then if you want to frame it, the nice thing about five by sevens is I get a lot of frames at my thrift store and I frame them and I give them away as gifts. Um, but I sometimes put them behind the glass and sometimes I don't. I have that kestrel is one I didn't put behind glass because it does have more raised areas and I have put others behind glass. It's glossy and then it kind of has that shine on it. I don't really like that as much. It's up to you. Um, just know that if you do put it behind the glass, leave it dry at least a day so that you don't have any tackiness that it would stick to the glass. Questions? So, okay, go ahead. Do you have a question from somebody? Yes, Catherine? Well, I was just wondering, uh, you know, all of these are, are painted beforehand, the background, right? And then you go in and do all of that. So you don't, so the, the 
decoupage, the Mod Podge is also the finisher of it. Yes. You don't use an acrylic or, a, you know, like a sealer or, okay. No. Yep, okay. that decoupage is all I use, that Mod Podge. Would you use, would you do that on a wood or a plastic, anything? Okay, anything um, you I'm not sure about plastic or metal because, so yeah. the decoupage glue was, I mean, Paper. long, long ago, if you remember, people used to decoupage boxes and make, right. you know, like hints and put de designs on that or on furniture. I mean, that's what it came about from. Okay. As an artist, I have used that paint on matte finish for acrylic things. Um, that could probably be used too for the finishing off this if you wanted to. I, like I said, I bought a big container of that Mod Podge on, it was half price coupon. So I have that to last me quite a while. So I just use that for everything and it works out good. And that's a plaid product, right? Plaid? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I know there's other brands that do the same thing, but um, I knew that worked well and I was, I was okay with going with brand name. And you prefer the matte finish, not the gloss. Yes. Yes. The same reason glass bothers me. It's a distraction to the artwork, you know, glossiness. I, even in my house, there's not many things I like that are glossy unless it's really serving a, a purpose for that decor. I always like matte because then it lets the other stuff be more seen and prominent. Okay, so here's two other examples. This is my little cardinal. I chose this one to show you how. The breast has flowers in it, but you know, when you pull back from it, it almost gives you a mottled color effect like you do see in cardinals with some white and reds. Um, the tail I did rip, I did cut. I did paint the feet and the eyeball and the beak. The bark has a lot of, you know, nice textural browns I found. And then I made this little pine tree with some snow on it. And I spattered the whole thing with acrylic spatter before I then coated it. I left everything dry and then coated it. The um, pileated woodpecker is a lot of solid colors in his body. I'm not sure why I went with that. Probably because he is a lot of black. You don't really see too many variations in, in, a, in his black back. So the, the variations in the breast area with the grays, I have some shades, but you can see those, those black areas. I, I use strips and some of them look even cut. So I did that in 19 and I don't really remember much about it. The, the crown on him, this little hood, I have patterns in. But I really have patterns in the leaves and the bark on this, what looks to me like a birch tree. And I really like patterns. I just, I feel like those patterns give it a different feel to it. Um, I painted the feet, the eyes, and the beak in that one. So that's a little bit of difference with him compared to the others. Questions before we look at some of the references. Do you have a recommendation as to how large to rip our paper? Well, like I said, that very first rent I did, I had some large pieces. Now that's large for the five by seven. So maybe there were some that were like an inch or so. And I felt like they were too big. I, I don't know. And then I got so tiny for some areas. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm starting to turn this into like a pointillism effect. You know what pointillism is? Where, yeah, you just do tiny dots. And I didn't want to do that. So that's what I mean about getting more comfortable with finding patterns that give you the illusion of um, things that are happening without having like, so in other words, you could find one pattern that you use an inch piece of versus three patterns that you're doing quarter inch size to get the same effect. So it's nice to have the patterns that give you that variation with a little bit of larger paper. That's my preference. I think you'll probably do like I did. You, it's good to start bigger and decide how much smaller you wanna go and then maybe back up a little bit and make them not quite so small. Okay, does that answer your question? I can't give it, and especially if you do like an eight by 10 or if you're subject matter, I mean, you don't have to do birds. You could do the boat or you could do a house or, you know, whatever your subject matter is, you might have something that doesn't need as many variated pieces of paper in it. 
So here's a few other things to look at. Here's a YouTube coll uh, collage example I found for the more traditional abstract style that I thought I'd show you this artist because this is what I always um, thought of. And it's, he, they say surreal collages, but this is the idea like my daughter did of finding magazines or other resources, um, textbooks for pictures. And then um, he cuts them out. So he does a lot of cutting, exact cutting. He cuts out his objects and his parts, uh, lots of parts and puts them together and saves them into a book. And then he reassembles them into these more um, abstract creations of how he does it. So I am gonna send you an email and after this, you'll have lots of things to go to and see. This will be one of them in case you wanna watch what he does with pictures and how he puts them together. So these are like things he saved that he might someday use. Um, there's one he cut out very intricately and they interview him, but here's how he saves them in an old uh, magnetic photo album. He just saves all these pieces so that someday he might put them together in a picture. And then here's where he's showing how he puts them together. So he does a lot of large things he puts together and he, he uses spray glue on them. Um, very, very artistic, abstract type. Things. So that's one of the resources I'm sending you so that you can just see. And that's almost finished what it looks like then there. Let me see if they pull out again. Some of it's slow-mo, some of it's fast. There you go. So see how he's just really carefully choosing where he puts his, how he puts it together. I've seen people do this with fabric. Sometimes they add 3D elements into it. So there's lots of options you have. So these are my Instagram people I follow that I like to see how they do it a lot because it is very unique. So Tracy English, she kind of prints her own, takes solid paper and puts stuff on it, painting, printing, whatever, and then cuts it out into all these wonderful illustrations and shapes. A lot of hers are sometimes designs, little cityscapes and things. So hers is a unique way of looking at collage and how she does it. She has her own style. And then the next one is Nisa. Nisa does the more painterly collages where she cuts and pastes and ends up with things that look like she used paint. She also does masters type people, Van Gogh, and turns them into paper um, interpretations of them. So that's kind of cool too. Her, she's an example I'll send to you that you can see. And then Claire Young's is also one. She rubber stamps a lot of her paper. And then she cuts out her paper to make these really whimsical, cute animal um, designs that she prints and they turn them into kids books. They use it for illustration. But um, you can see in this one, where is it? I, I, went, I wanted you to see how she does her own printing of things. So here you see a little, like she printed these pieces of paper and then she cuts it out and turns it into parts of her animals. So that's another reference I'll send to you so that you can see it. And then I have three different blogs here for you to see. There's one, um, and I picked each of them for a different reason. This one talks about torn paper collage tutorial and uses uh, these trees as an example of how to do it. So that's one, if you wanna walk through it with that person and read about it and do it, you can do it. Here's a blog on just things to think about if you're doing collage, things that go into it, materials. And she also talks about turning this Apple picture into a collage like that. So that's similar to those, you know, painterly more um, mosaic type things where you're adding pieces of paper together that look like painting. And the last one is from Smashing Magazine that talks just a lot about all the different things to think about for collage. Um, she talks about Picasso and his early collage works, which I didn't know so much about until I was researching this. I always thought of Picasso just as doing abstract art, but he really did a lot of um, collages for a while too. So those are some of the things. And here's one actually on Pablo. I picked this out so you 
read about him and see some of his work because you might want to go more in an abstract direction than when than doing birds or animals or some other thing that's more um, a definite style. This is a YouTube on Molly Peacock's garden. I'll send you that. She is somebody from the 1700s who only started doing it when she was in her 70s. And there's a book about it. One of my learners sent me that. Um, so it's very interesting to see what she did back then because they think she might have been the first person to really invent the process of making collages. And she did all these these uh, floral things with how she created them. So I'll send you that. And then one last one for Eileen Downs, who they say the artist who paints with bits of corn paper. And she does some of those fantastic animals. Um, the, I don't know if the cow one I first showed you was it or not, but she really has some really nice, cool pictures for you to look at there. Any questions before I summarize and close things up? Because we only have a few minutes left. All right. In summary, a collage is a piece of art made by sticking various different materials such as photographs and pieces of paper onto a surface. Inspiration and resources for projects can be found with photographs and on many blogs and websites. Basic supplies needed include paper, glue, a canvas board, or sturdy backing that can be used. Thank you so much for coming. If you want to share your experience on any social media, you can hashtag it at Get Set Up or at Get Set Up or send Liz at GetSetUp.io an email and tell her about what you thought or a picture of your collage you created. She does blogs and she might write about it. And I'm looking at, wow, that's really nice. Were you just doing that now while we were talking? <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. Well, you're already started. You can finish it now. I, I just used Elmer's glue stick and Christmas wrapping paper just to get the feel for it. Oh, well, you got the you, Yes, you got the Before feel. Of it. Very good. That's nice. Else. That's good great. Job. <laughs> Anyways, whatever it is. <laughs> That's neat. That's I love to see that people are using it and doing it. That's what counts. So if you need help with anything else or want to share or ask for questions or whatever, you can send email to help at getsetup.io and related classes coming up are how to take great photos on your iPhone and art of the Modern Museum of Art. And that my next classes are basic drawing nature inspired and introduction to calligraphy. After this class, you'll get an email. It will have the notes in that I reviewed. Um, I'll also send you an attachment. And then if you click on give feedback, you can share your thoughts, comments, click from one all the way up to five stars to rate the class, um, make suggestions for what else you'd like to see offered or improved. Those are things we look at and appreciate you taking the time to do. And I read them all. So thank you for sharing. And remember that if you're interested in like being part of Get Set Up, you can write to them. You can let them know you might want to host an interest group. Uh, we grow and grow each week as we come at, at, uh, associated with more government agencies and senior living centers, that kind of thing. So we are really trying to offer more classes too, and we look to you for ideas. So Thank you so much for everybody coming. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. I hope you get to go create some Thank collage you. art. This was wonderful. Thank you. You're Thank welcome, you. Patty. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great day.